Hello, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome. After the, this is the, the last session before uh, the end of the day. And so we are very, very glad to see all of you here who joined today. My name is Marco Segone. I'm the director of uh, UNFPA, the United Nations Population Fund, based in, uh, in New York. And I have the privilege today of chairing uh, this important session. Important session because it's a session that will focus on national relation capacity development in general, and specifically really on how to support uh, young and emerging evaluators. So we, uh, we, we are very glad to have a, a, a great uh, panel today. Uh, I will just shortly introduce uh, each of them in a, in a few minutes. But before doing that, I just wanted to mention really the importance of national ocean capacity development. I think that probably uh, virtually everybody in this room would agree that countries should be in the driving seat when it comes to evaluation. So it should be the countries themselves to evaluate their own national uh, policies and programs. Uh, it should be the countries themselves to decide what are the evaluation questions that are relevant to the policy makers of, of the country. And when I say country, I mean not only the government, but actually the government, obviously, but also uh, parliaments, uh, but also civil society organizations, academia, uh, private sector, and of course, uh, also uh, young people. So, in that case, the role of a uh, multilateral agency is, is, shouldn't be really to evaluate, but it should be to strengthen the country capacities for the countries themselves to, to evaluate. And of course, I mean, each country has, uh, is in, a different, in a different positions in the journey towards uh, true country-led and national-led uh, evaluations. But multilateral agencies, so the, the role of multilateral agency in this case is really about supporting country capacities. And just as a reminder, the good news is that even the United Nations General Assembly had two resolutions on this specific subject, one about 10 years ago and one that was uh, approved by the General Assembly just a few months ago, where there are, the General Assembly was really asking for all the different stakeholders to come together to support national evaluation capacity development. So that's why uh, this session, I think, is going to be really a great opportunity to, to hear uh, from different perspectives. Different perspectives because we have a quite diverse uh, panel here today. So we will have two presentations. The first is by uh, Daniel Patrick Alonso uh, Vargas. Uh, you can show you, okay. <laughs> Here. And uh, so he's a multi country relation specialist at the UNICEF regional office for uh, South Asia. But before that, he also worked in the independent evaluation office at UNDP uh, in New York and also as evaluation officer at the African Development Bank in uh, Abidjan. So uh, he, he will uh, bring really the, the experience uh, not only of UNICEF, the organization where he's working, but actually the experience of UNEDAP. And UNEDAP is the network of uh, evaluation specialists from 12 different UN agencies here in, uh, in Asia, Asia Pacific. And I have to say that is a quite unique network. You know, here in uh, Asia Pacific, uh, you know, we are quite lucky having UNEDAP is the only region where the UN has been able to come together when it comes to evaluation we're talking about to come together and really to uh, deliver uh, technical assistance and capacity development, not only to the UN country teams in the region, but also to other stakeholders, including government, parliaments, etc., in a, in a systemic manner and, and uh, as a UN team. So uh, really congratulations to uh, UNEDAP, to the current UNEDAP members. I see in the room also some uh, of the former uh, UNEDAP members. Uh, because I think it's already it's something like 11 years old or even perhaps more. Uh, so we will have really the, the opportunity to, to hear from, uh, from Daniel about uh, the, the work of, uh, of UNEDAP. 
Then the second presenter is uh, Randika Demel. He's the manager of the Asia Pacific Evolution Association, APEA, and also former board member in, of the Sri Lanka Evolution Association and co-founder of Evalus Sri Lanka and Evalus Asia. Now, Evalus is really a great uh, forum and network of young people who are really interested in uh, becoming, becoming actor uh, in, in evaluation and beyond. And, you know, Evalus was launched back in 2015 at the Parliament of, Shri, of, uh, sorry, of Nepal when there was the first Eval Partner uh, Global Forum uh, during the first ever international year of, uh, of evaluation. So, and in these more than 10 years, uh, Evalus have grown. Uh, they, they have almost 20,000 uh, members all over the world. So can you imagine 20,000 young evaluators who are really keen to, uh, to transform evaluations? All the, all, all the things that we have been discussing in these few days, I think that young people are really the best positions to, to make those kind of transformation that we, be, we have been talking about. And so uh, 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 Randika will, uh, will talk about, about really the importance of young evaluators in national relation capacity development and the relationship with, uh, uh, with UNEDAP. After these two almost formal presentations, then we will have uh, the panel. And here we have uh, really three uh, great panelists. We have uh, 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 Romulo Emanuel Miral, who is uh, the Director General of the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department at the House of Representatives at the Congress of the Philippines. So we, we just heard also in the previous session about the importance of bridging the gap between the policymakers and the evaluators. And so I think uh, he, he will be uh, a key person who can talk a little bit on a, on a what the Philippines is doing in trying to bridge this, uh, this gap. Then uh, uh, we, we will have uh, uh, Akilesh Kumar, uh, the director of the Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office at the Niti Young, uh, the government of, uh, of India. Uh, so uh, Kumar has 17 years of experience. Uh, and previously, he, he, he worked also as Joint Director of the National Statistical Office, as a Chief Stati Statistical Officer at the National Crime Record Bureau, and as an Assistant Director at the National Sample Survey Office. So really, from, uh, you know, from the Parliament to the government, and then uh, to uh, Oyuna Chulundorj, who is the Monitoring and Evolution Advisor at the UNFPA Asia and Pacific Regional Office. Uh, Oyuna also has uh, 20 years of experience uh, and you know, he has worked in, uh, in different um, countries from Mongolia to Bangladesh, etc. And he, he, she, she will also bring uh, you know, a very important perspective uh, also not only on national national capacity development, but really uh, on how to work together with other uh, UN agencies in the framework of UNEDAP, but also uh, how to support uh, young and emerging evaluators. So with this, uh, perhaps we can just move to, um, to the first presenter. Uh, I already uh, apologize with uh, the presenters and the discuss discussants. I, 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 I will try to be quite strict with the, with the timekeeping so that we will keep time for a question and answer and, and more dialogue with, uh, uh, with all of you. So, Daniel, uh, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Perfect. So, I hope you are, you are not too tired of PPT uh, PowerPoints. Uh, I reassure you, I only have four slides. And since I'm based in Nepal, I couldn't resist about making a reference to the mountain, to uh, the Everest. So in this slide, what I'm doing is that I'm presenting the timeline of key uh, UN events uh, for NECD, as in, uh, in the introduction uh, by Marco, demonstrating that it's an ongoing journey that commenced about two decades ago. So the first res resolution underscored that national government hold the primary responsibility for coordinating and evaluating external assistance. 
moving forward, we saw uh, the Paris Declaration and later the ACRA agenda, both emphasize ownership and alignment, uh, which are fundamental NECD principles. In 2006, we saw the first uh, evaluation policy for a UN agency, uh, and these have been introduced uh, in other agencies in time and progressively have integrated NECD. The next two uh, resolutions of 2007 and 2012 further accentuated the importance of country taking ownership and leadership in evaluating, but also called uh, the UN to intensify efforts to enhance the capacity development of member states in evaluation. And the turning point was uh, came in 2014 resolution mentioned by Marco as a central milestone for NECD at the UN. It was the first standalone uh, resolution dedicated to uh, strengthening evaluation capacity. And finally, very recent resolution focused on country-led evaluation and calls upon the UN again to support member states in conducting them. Important to mention that this uh, resolution was actually supported by several countries in, in our region, uh, namely Cambodia, China, Mongolia, Philippines, and Sri Lanka. Moving to the next slide, uh, we showcase the diverse type of support provided by UNIDAP members in our region, aligning uh, the involvement of several types of actors. This slide also tried to display, dispel the, the misconception that NECD support is only about training. It go much further. So firstly, UNIDAP members have actively supported the assessment and mapping of national evaluation capacity. For instance, UNDP is conducting a national diagnostic in Bhutan in collaboration with the GEI, while UNICEF initiated uh, uh, or will reinitiate recently uh, a similar exercise in the state of Odisha in India. On evaluation policy, UNIDAP, notably uh, UNDP and UNICEF, contributed to the development of evaluation policies and legislation. An example is UNICEF's current engagement uh, in Bangladesh for the development of the first ever evaluation policy there. Next, we have uh, UNIDAP support to institutional strengthening of key NECD actors, such as parliaments, ministry, ME units, VOPE, and academia. And for example, there we have UNESCO providing uh, support to Ministry of Education for evaluating their education program. We also have support to VOPE, which is central for UNIDAP uh, type of support, like uh, the support from uh, UNFPA to APEA for the developing of the Asian regional uh, evaluation strategy. More punctual support is also provided uh, for joint and country-led evaluation through technical, financial, and administrative assistance. For example, we have UN Women providing support to the Ministry of uh, Women Affairs in Cambodia for the evaluation of National Action Plan of Violence Against Women, while UNICEF is also currently supporting five country-led evaluation in our region. On point five, we have uh, that the fact that UNDAP also targets individual capacity, mostly through training program, and this is probably one of the most common type of support provided by UNDAP members. It includes corporate uh, programs like uh, the UNICEF IMPRESS and Excel program with almost a uh, thousand graduates in our region. And we have actually today one of the graduates in our panel. Uh, it also includes financial support uh, to attend uh, trainings like UNFPA support to parliamentarians to participate to the EDET training. And finally, we have a specific programs that are tailored, uh, created uh, to partners uh, to their unique context and need, such as UNICEF collaboration with the Office of Civil Service Commission in Thailand. On point six, uh, UNIDAP has developed uh, various tools, including guidelines, uh, standards, and competency frameworks to support those evaluation champions. And finally, we work with those champions to raise awareness and advocate for evaluation. Through platform like uh, the NEC conference uh, organized by UNDP, a conference dedicated to a, uh, an NECD, but also by engaging in key forums such as UNFPA involvement in the 2018 Global Parliamentarian Forum for Evaluation. UNDAP also uh, support awareness through evaluation events such as this one, but also like the example of ILO backing participants from the Philippines, from Vietnam to participate to the NEC conference or FAO uh, supporting Sri Lanka Evaluation Association for its evaluation week. 
moving to the uh, next slide. So from this experience, uh, there are some principles that can be extracted, which are worth considering when engaging in, in uh, NECD, but those are the, in the perspective of uh, UN agencies. So first, coordinated partnerships. Uh, the most diverse, inclusive, and well-coordinated uh, partnership is the better chance for results to be accepted and sustained. Secondly, efforts are likely to be sustainable if they are led by uh, national entities and not third parties. Thirdly, identifying and recognizing uh, existing capacity is critical to the effectiveness of any CD intervention. On the fourth, we have cooperation relationship, which should be based on mutual trust and commitment for the long-term success of any CD. And finally, for the long lasting, uh, lasting NECD result require time and flexibility from all types so that the investment can grow on NECD. Moving on the last slide. Um, so in, there, in this slide, I present the potential next step for UNEDAP as they have been outlined in the very recent report that assessed the progress of the implementation of the 2014 resolution, which is the resolution I mentioned in my first slide. So in there, uh, so in those uh, recommendations, so we have first, uh, the first recommendation where UNEDAP members, or the UN as is formulated in the report, should conduct their evaluation in the way that foster national capacity. And this means that national government should play a, a leading role in the management structure, so such as the reference group or the steering committee. When feasible, UNDAP members should foster joint and country-led evaluation, especially when addressing agency priorities, and we heard that uh, throughout this conference. In country uh, with national evaluation system, UNDAP should consider using national evaluation guidelines and standards. And finally, for the first recommendation, we have UNDAP should commit in strengthening the capacity of local evaluator, including supporting young emerging evaluator. So for the second recommendation we have from this report, we have UNEDAP should continue to support the enabling environment, uh, institutional and individual capacity in partner country. And to do so, UNEDAP should support system analysis to identify strengths and weaknesses in the evaluation ecosystem, and then co-design a capacity development strategy. Additionally, UNEDAP members should further engage uh, with senior policy maker in the executive and parliament and, and to increase their exposure in evidence and form policy. And finally, UNEDAP should further facilitate the engagement with non-state actors, including VOPE, academic, uh, and training institution. And for the last recommendation, uh, UNEDAP members should further coordinate and collaborate on NECD. So there is a call for UNEDAP member to increase the investment in, in NECD and allocate additional time and resources to it. Additionally, UNDAP member should consider including NECD as an explicit part of individual agency country program, and perhaps maybe even in the UNCDF, which is the, the uh, overarching planning uh, uh, tool for the UN in each country. And finally, UNDAP member should ensure interagency information sharing, coordination, and collaboration on NECD. So clearly, UNDAP should not stop there. Uh, there is a potential to incorporate additional recommendation uh, uh, than presenting this report, including facilitating South-South cooperation, but also expanding the coordination mechanisms beyond the UN, including MDBs and obviously the GIA, the Global uh, Evaluation Initiative. So those are just some of the points that we'll be discussing in the coming weeks within the UNEDAP, uh, how to foresee and plan for, for the future on NCD. So thank you everyone for your attention and back to you. Marco. Thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. And thanks a lot for keeping with the time. You know, you. Uh, so I think it was very interesting also, you know, the additional details that you gave us about the unit up of how, you know, 11 different United Nations agencies came, came together uh, really to deliver a synchronized and coordinated assistance to countries. But also to remind us that national relation capacity development does not equate to training only. Training is just one small component. And I think it's very important that we, we should always remember that national relation capacity development is obviously about individual capacities. And I would say individual capacity of both evaluators to supply good quality evaluations, but also of policy makers to demand for evaluations and also to use evaluation in national uh, policy making. 
but then of course i mean there is also the institutional uh, level that is very important and the enabling environment so you know the the, the slides where you were uh, uh, explaining the support of unidap i think it cover very nicely the three levels uh, that we should always make reference when we talk about national relation capacity development and one of the lessons learned about about ownership national ownership i think is very important and again you know we always talk about the gap, uh, as already mentioned, between uh, the evolution community and the users and the policy makers. And I would just like to uh, acknowledge that actually Asia Pacific is one of the uh, region in the world that is the most advanced when it comes to this, because uh, the, the Global Parliamentarian Forum for Evaluation, that is a network of national parliamentarians who come together exactly to demand for evaluation and to use evaluation in national policy making and also to uh, advocate for national evaluation policy was launched here in the region at the parliament of nepal in 2015 and since then uh, other uh, important meetings in the national parliament of, uh, of uh, sri lanka or kyrgyzstan happen here in, in the region uh, and actual and the chair of the Global Parliamentarian Forum for Revolution is also from the region, from, um, from Sri Lanka. So Asia Pacific clearly on this specific aspect, I think is really one of the region that is leading at global level. And so I just wanted to acknowledge that because I think it's, uh, it's very important. This brings to the second presentation from uh, uh, Randika. So uh, Daniel presented us with uh, the overview about national national capacity development. Now Randika will try also to focus more on the, on the young people, on how young people can be engaged in evaluation in a meaningful manner. You know, I always say that young people is not about the future. Young people is about, about the present to ensure a better future for everybody. So that's why I think that it is so important to also for us as how to say former young people, uh, <laughs> if I talk, speak about myself, uh, that we are really serious and intentional in engaging young people in a meaningful manner, not in a tokenist manner, in a meaningful manner uh, in, in, in evolution processes and, uh, and in, uh, uh, in uh, policy making. So, Randika, over to you. Uh, thank you, Marco, and good afternoon, everyone. So my presentation will focus on uh, building the evaluation capacity of young and emerging evaluators, some of the work done in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so my outline of my presentation, I will talk about some of the challenges faced by YEs in the Asia-Pacific region, which is important if you want to professionalize the field, and also then the initiatives taken to support YEs uh, through UNIDEP member country, and also the, some of the lessons learned. And so this diagram here uh, categorizes the challenges uh, faced by uh, YEs into four categories. Sorry, Randika, can you just explain to everybody what Y is? Uh, yeah. Is because uh, perhaps not everybody is aware. Yeah. Uh, so Y is stands for Young and Emerging Evaluators. So the definition according to Evaluate uh, Global is a new, uh, someone who is under 35 years of age or who is new to the evaluation field. Okay. Uh, so it's categorized into four uh, components, and this was developed by one of our core leaders, Yatin Divaka, from Evaluate Asia and Evaluate India. So it's one is capacity development, formalization and opportunities, uh, networking and support, and funding and access to re resources. So looking at capacity building development, so one major challenge in the region right now is that we don't have formalized educational programs in evaluation in the bar, bachelor's, master's, or PhD. Only in uni University of Melbourne in Australia has that. And that's a big challenge in order to professionalize the field and take the uh, get young people involved. So based on some of these challenges, Evaluate Asia chapter was fo uh, f uh, formed in 2019 in December. And the main aim was to build evaluation capacity of YEs in the region. Uh, we have one of our co-founders here, Erica, <laughs> Uh, who helped uh, f uh, lead the initiative to uh, uh, have a chapter for young and emerging evaluators. And it's supported by Evaluate Global and APIA, the regional WOPE for, uh, for Asia Pacific. And now, under Evaluate Asia, we have uh, about 11, chapter, 11 national chapters, which is an important part of getting 
why he's involved in the valuation field and networking. And also a uh, part of uh, this why developing, uh, strengthening <coughs> why is was is one of the themes part of the Asia Pacific Regional Strategy, which was which Daniel mentioned, which is support was supported by UNFPA, was developed in 2020. Uh, so part of the promoting young and, imag uh, eval uh, young and imagining evaluators, one of the themes, there are eight themes, is to help, main aim is to build the capacity of YEs in the region and also um, uh, increase the awareness on the, on the evaluation field. So now I'll talk about some of the initiatives that have, were taken after the evaluation strategy was developed and Evaluate Asia was formed. So for the first time in the region in 2019, we had YE-focused webinars in the Asia-Pacific region. It started in 2019 and it was uh, supported by UNFPA. So this, this, the aim of these uh, webinars is to build the technical knowledge of YEs and also to increase the awareness about the evaluation field. As you can see from the challenges I showed you, a lot of people in the region, youth are not aware about evaluation. So they only learn it if they get into an NGO or something like that. So that's why this webinar series was launched. And then in Sri Lanka, supported by UNFPA, uh, UNICEF, for the first time ever, we had a capacity building workshop in 2020 during the COVID time. Uh, and during this workshop, uh, the career development module, module for the first time for YEs was introduced in the Asia Pacific region. And the main objective of this training was to uh, develop uh, competent and ethical evaluators and they get them interested in the field. And then we have our flagship program, Evaluate Asia, which is supported by UNFPA, is the Asia Pacific Winter School, which happens every December. So this started in uh, 2020, uh, <clears throat> one. And uh, now uh, this year it will be for the it was held virtually because of COVID. For this time this year in Manila, it will be the first time it will be in person uh, for young and emerging evaluators, and it's supported by UNFPA. This uh, the one in Manila as well. And so th the this is an important program for Evaluate Asia because it helps to build the YE network in the region and also to improve their knowledge and skills in evaluation. So a lot of the people who participated in the winter school went on to, uh, uh, went on to start their own value chapters in the region and to become champions. And some of them are already involved in uh, working with our different teams and getting involved. So this is a starting program for, young and for youth in the region. And then also uh, we developed uh, inter-regional virtual career resource hub for monitoring and evaluation for young and emerging evaluators. This was supported by Evaluate Partner, Eval Partners, and um, it was done by APIA Field Dev, Evaluate Sri Lanka, and Evaluate Asia. And anyone, any young uh, YE or anyone can go to this website, and in this website you get tips on how to do, uh, conduct uh, an interview, how to write a CV, and also about the degree programs and trainings globally. So this career hub has been very useful for YEs, and based on this, we have had trainings uh, on career development in the region. And also another program we have is the peer-to-peer -peer sessions, which is supported by UNFP and the World Bank. Uh, and this is a very unique program where before the sessions, the YEs sent their questions, their practical and technical challenges they are facing, and they are addressed during this session. So this, uh, these sessions have been very helpful for YEs in order to, uh, so they get an understanding also what kind of career they can get from in the evaluation field. So our next one will be on the 18th of this month, on 17th. And then we had uh, recently concluded in April Youth in Evaluation Week, which was co-led by UNFPA Global Parliamentarians Forum for Evaluation and Eval Youth. And during this uh, Youth in Evaluation Week, uh, Asia Pacific region ha had 13 events. And also a lot of the YEs took part in signing the manifesto, which you can see in the website. And also a lot of our YEs were involved in developing standards for academia, government, uh, and NGOs. And uh, I was involved in developing the standards for youth organizations. 
And uh, finally, I want to talk about some other lessons learned. So one thing is it's important to have young people involved uh, in evaluation studies, uh, like if I, I, you, the UNIDAP members, I think UNFPA has a class to involve, uh, involve some of the YEs in the teams, and also, especially in the VOPES, in the Voluntary Organization for Professional Evaluation, in the board. So right now in APIA, we have two YEs part of the APIA board, which is useful to give a voice to the uh, YEs. So they, they are the ones who can tell the challenges they face and how we can take this profession forward. And another thing is, it's important from our experience with Evaluate Asia is to create YE networks. That's why we went on, we had the chapter kickoff series and helped to create different national chapters in the region because that helps them to volunteer in the evaluation field and also network with others and come up with different programs. This year we had YE networks, uh, national chapters involved in doing their own thing, having capacity building training, case competition in India. So, and Evaluate Pakistan has signed an agreement uh, with UNICEF uh, in Pakistan where in all their, in their consulting projects that a YE should be part of the team. So that's a, uh, a unique thing. That, so other chapters, we have been uh, telling them also to do similar things like that. And also it's important to uh, create educational programs. Uh, so like I said, if UNIDAP members can support in the universities, because right now we don't have uh, bachelor's or master's or PhD because that's a big challenge to professionalize the field and also to get people interested in uh, evaluation and in order to build their technical skills. Uh, only uh, in Sri Lanka, UNICEF supported a postgraduate diploma. Right now there is in uh, monitoring and evaluation. So that's one thing we have to look into in the region. And also uh, to regularly have capacity building program. Now the ones we have are all free, so that's uh, good, but uh, like a lot of the other trainings, it's not accessible because it requires a lot of costs. And also there are sometimes language barriers, so I think sometimes these trainings will have to cater according to the region, according to their language. Uh, and also that's where some of our UNIDAP members can help. And also another thing UNIDAP can help is to provide internship opportunities. That's the way they can get practical experience because for me personally, I started evaluation also when I got an internship when I was studying in the US. That's how I built uh, my career in, in evaluation through internships. So I think if we can start that more in the region, that will be useful. And another thing is we don't have right now is a mentorship program. So I think that is very important in order to provide guidance uh, to young and emerging evaluators. And thank you. <laughs> Thanks, hello, Grandika. You know, sometimes when I speak with my colleagues with uh, white hairs about engaging uh, young people, you know, there, there, there are some skepticism saying, well, they don't know what they want, they have no capacities, etc. I think Randika just show us that they know exactly what they want. They have a lot of energy capacity, etc. And I really think that, you know, this kind of intergenerational partnership is really a win-win partnership for, uh, uh, for everybody and for the entire evolution community. And I think that in the intergenerational partnership, I mean, Randika just showed us that actually young people, they can do everything that they want alone, even without uh, seniors, except one thing. And that one thing is the access to the labor market. If we do not give them the opportunity to access the labor market, that's where it is really the challenge uh, lies. And I'm, I'm really so glad that we will hear from um, Akilesh Kumari just in a, in a few moments also uh, how, for example, the government of India uh, is really facilitating this access to the labor market for young evaluators. Um, but just to say that, for example, in the case of UNFPA, uh, we, we included that in our evaluation policy, that is our a normative framework that guides all the evaluation function in uh, our uh, agency. And so in our evaluation policy, it's clearly stated that young people should be meaningful, engaged at the maximum level as, as possible. And, and, but that, that has to be intentional. Uh, it, it has to be intentional. It means that we need to be ready to share power with young people. 
So, you know, it's not always so easy, especially you can imagine a, a United Nations agency is a quite bureaucratic and political organization. Uh, so, but, you know, if it's possible in a UN agency, I would say that it's possible almost in any organization. But I'm sure Oyuna also will talk more about that uh, uh, later. Uh, but but just to, to share also another another experience, just a few years ago, uh, we brought together 10 UN agencies, again, to facilitate access of, to the labor market to young people. And in this, with, within these 10 UN agencies, we were able to identify 100 positions at country, regional and headquarter level for young people, specifically for young people. Unfortunately, we were able to cover only 50 of them because of funding constraints. Also, in the case of the UN, we have uh, funding limitations. But I'm just mentioning that because it's really up to each of us to make that happen. And, and really, this, this aspect of the access to the labor market, I think, is what you know, is the, the last step that is needed for, uh, uh, to make uh, uh, the meaningful engagement of young people uh, a reality. So <coughs> let me move for a, for a moment. We will come back to the young people. But before that, uh, Let's see, you know, young people, of course, are a very important stakeholder, but, but uh, there are also many other important stakeholders. And policymakers are another uh, category, let's say, of important stakeholders. And that's why I would like to, to ask to uh, Romulo Emanuel Miral, from where you sit, that is uh, a very different perspective, you know, as Director General at the Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department at the House of Representatives in the Philippines. Uh, what has been so far the, the journey towards formulating but also approving an evaluation policy? Uh, and what, has been, what have been some of the challenges and lessons learned that your country has encountered and, and that you would like to share with other, with other countries? Uh, because we, we always say about the importance of uh, engaging with policymakers. Uh, but historically, we as the evolution community, we have not been so successful. Usually, uh, you know, in, conf in evolution conferences, uh, we talk always among ourselves. Uh, very seldomly, we invite uh, parliamentarians, uh, policymakers. Uh, so, so that's something that I think that we as the evolution community, we have a, a kind of responsibility to really to push the boundaries, as uh, was mentioned also in a, one of the previous uh, sessions. So, Romulo, uh, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Marco, and uh, good afternoon to all. Um, again, uh, I think um, we all know how uh, the importance of an evaluation culture, um, the wide scale and systematic use of um, uh, the supply and uh, demand for evaluation in development. But uh, unfortunately, unlike in the um, market for goods and services, where you have this uh, invisible hands or the price mechanism to guide or link the demand and supply for evaluation or evidence, uh, it's not so for, um, for evidence or, or evaluation. That's why it's important to uh, have systems in order to coordinate, facilitate, and uh, guide the, uh, the demand or supply for evaluation to, or to create that environment where, evaluate or where the use and, uh, dem uh, and supply of evaluation will flourish. Um, and um, I think uh, we, somehow we are in the right direction now with, uh, because starting in 2015, uh, the National Economic Development Authority, our planning agency, and the Department of Budget and Management uh, came up with a uh, a joint memorandum circular establishing the national evaluation policy framework. And I think this is a very important step because uh, it established uh, the principles, uh, the organizational structure of how to steer and um, how to uh, organ uh, the structure, the necessary in different agencies to conduct uh, more evaluation and use more evaluation and uh, also to provide um, the necessary resources because uh, that policy uh, provides for uh, earmarking of a, of a percentage of the budget of the, of the agency for the conduct and use of uh, uh, evaluation studies. Um, but unfortunately, um, that was in 2015 and um, uh, 
there was a change in administration after then. Uh, and the new administration, especially with the COVID uh, crisis or pandemic, um, actually the, the national evaluation policy framework was actually sidetracked uh, because uh, there are other competing demands for resources and uh, they think that uh, uh, this is uh, somehow that can be, um, uh, can be postponed. And so um, nothing was uh, happened uh, in relation to that national evaluation policy framework in terms of its operationalization. Uh, in, in fact, until now, uh, the operating guidelines for that framework has not yet been issued. Um, and um, also one limitation of that uh, national evaluation policy framework is that uh, it's simply um, um, joint memorandum circular of the two departments or agencies of the executive. And so it covers only the executive uh, uh, agencies. But uh, we're always talking about um, whole of government here. And uh, we think that uh, it should extend beyond the, ex uh, the executive um, um, branch of government uh, and it should cover the other branches like the, the legislative, the judiciary, as well as the local government units and all levels of government. And so um, we, um, given the inspiration that, uh, by attending in some of the conference, in fact, my first engagement with, uh, with evaluation was the Colombo um, a pay conference uh, back in 2018. So after that, uh, I, I studied the national evaluation policy framework and we tried to come up with a bill, uh, a proposed uh, bill that would uh, uh, institutionalize uh, national evaluation policy across all the government uh, sector. And um, we have uh, conducted and organized um, evaluation policy forum together with UNICEF. And, um, um, I think uh, when also looking at the challenges, um, uh, um, the main ch uh, it seems to be that while the national evaluation policy framework formulated by our executive agencies uh, were helpful in, for us in terms of coming up with the proposed bill, but unfortunately um, it seems that um, the support from the executive uh, regarding the legislation or coming up with the law is not uh, that um, very strong because they, um, they think that there's already this uh, policy that they can use to conduct evaluation so that um, uh, the legislation would be, would be good but, not, but may not be necessary from the point of view of uh, the executive. And so when, uh, sometimes when the, con, uh, like, uh, when the legislature conduct uh, committee hearings about the bill, and um, uh, in the table they see, on the other, hand of the other end of the table, they only see junior staff attending or uh, the public hearing, uh, they don't see the, that there's uh, uh, the importance of this bill from the point of view of the agency because it really matters uh, uh, the people to whom uh, the legislators are talking and it uh, really signals uh, the importance of, this, of, the, uh, of, the pro of the proposed measure. So that's uh, one uh, the thing, uh, that we think should be uh, somehow hasn't uh, really uh, helped us in pushing forward uh, the National Evaluation uh, Policy Bill. Um, but uh, we have actually found a lot of opportunities uh, to uh, advocate for monitoring evaluation system because in the various committee hearings uh, where in other proposed uh, legislations are being discussed, um, they all, they are, legislators are asking for evidence or information that would help them uh, make the decision regarding the proposed measures. And, Unfortunately, many of the questions that they are asking cannot be, or the data that they're asking cannot be provided. And I recognize that um, if uh, we only have a good monitoring system or good monitoring evaluation system, some of their answer, uh, some of the evidence or information that they need to help uh, craft better legislation uh, would be uh, would be very useful. And another is uh, they, Congress has these oversight functions to uh, review uh, policies and programs of the government. And in fact, uh, the national budget is always reviewed annually. Uh, unfortunately, when, they, when uh, they review the budget, the different programs and projects and activities in the budget, uh, there, are no, uh, there are not enough information when we talk about um, the output or the performance of uh, of these programs and projects, but uh, the only data available actually is the utilization of the budget. So that um, uh, the, the budget allocated is based, uh, some largely based on whether the different ages are able to use this, this funds, but um, 
uh, whether they're able to use these funds effectively, efficiently to deliver the necessary output or services that would serve the people. That, nothing much uh, in, that, in that regard. So um, uh, I think the appreciation for monitoring evaluation uh, easily, uh, uh, and means slowly is um, uh, being uh, recognized. And um, uh, in uh, our also discussion uh, with, uh, like in the formulation of the Philippine Development Plan, um, where part of, or each chapter of the plan would include uh, the legislative priorities, uh, we are able to um, convince um, the planning agencies or other uh, stakeholders to support the inclusion of the National Evaluation Policy Bill among the legislative uh, priorities. And um, also there are uh, always, there will be always opportunities really to advocate for uh, monitoring evaluation because this uh, this r uh, runs at the heart of the of governance actually, and um, in, in just recently in Congress uh, there, this uh, there was a, a House resolution um, passed um, uh, in creating an institute uh, for uh, legislation and legislative governance. And uh, we thought that this would be a, a good vehicle uh, for our legislators to uh, understand and appreciate the value of monitoring and evaluation, as well as to uh, build the capacity for monitoring and evaluation, for, uh, for their use of monitoring and evaluation data, because these are very critical inputs to legislation and, again, their oversight function. So um, I think um, to sum up, um, I think. Uh, the lessons is that uh, I think the champions of evaluation, because there are, if you talk to people, they they uh, they, they recognize the importance of uh, monitoring evaluation, but um, unfortunately the champions are not um, working together. And I think if they collaborate more, they can accomplish more. And also, uh, again, uh, probably I would like to mention this um, in our discussion also with uh, attending the different committee hearings. Uh, sometimes the, the data or evidence that they need would not uh, necessarily come from uh, uh, in-depth evaluation studies, but uh, there, what is important is the timeliness of the data that they need. And uh, I think this can be uh, pa made possible if we, if we have a good uh, monitoring, monitoring system. Uh, I think in the Philippines, we have a very weak administrative data and I can link it, I can link this uh, problem to our weak monitoring and evaluation system. Because I think if we have a good monitoring evaluation system, a byproduct of that would be a good, good administrative data. So uh, I think um, when we, um, as of now, we're, uh, our, uh, the bill that we propose focus mainly on a national evaluation policy. But I think we should not uh, 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 separate monitoring uh, from that initiative. It's, uh, I think uh, when we talk about system, uh, it should be cover both monitoring and evaluation. So thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I mean, uh, I think uh, quite a fascinating uh, experience. Um, so I think really the idea of, uh, of the importance of having a national evaluation policy that really uh, give the normative framework in the country explain what are the ro roles and responsibility of the different stakeholders. As you, main, as you mentioned, the funding of obviously very important. But sometimes it's not enough. Uh, having a bill uh, is really what gives the, the authority for, for that to, to happen. But of course, that's, that's not so, so easy. I mean, you, you explained the, the experience of the Philippines. But, uh, you know, but that's, that's not easy, but it's possible. And as you mentioned, I think really the, the game changer is about having national champions. Uh, you know, about five, year, five months ago, uh, I was invited in Sri Lanka by Honorable Kabir Hashim, who, who is uh, a parliamentarian, who is really a champion for, uh, for evaluation. And, you know, he organized uh, meetings with the president, with the prime minister, with the speaker of the house, even with the leader of the opposition, because I think it's very important that always to keep in mind that evaluation is a technical exercise, but within a political environment, especially when we talk about national uh, policies. And so uh, a potential risk is that evaluation is used for political reasons. And so that's why it's very, by any particular political party, so that's why it's so important to have a, a national evaluation policy, a national bill, national evaluation bill that is support 
supported throughout this political spectrum in um, in uh, in the country and and uh, so it's really about really uh, national champions for for that to to happen but of course governments are perhaps the key the key player the key stakeholders to make all of that happening and i think that here we are really honored to have um, Akhilesh kumar as i said is the director of the uh, department uh, uh, for, I mean, of the Office for Development, Monitoring, and Evaluation at Nitya Young, that is the uh, federal uh, planning commission. I mean, the former planning commission of of, uh, of the government of of India. Uh, so, really, if you could share with us, uh, you know, from where you sit, from, from so from the government perspective, we just hear, you know, from the UN, we hear from uh, 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 the, the House, I mean, the Parliament, etc. So, from the government perspective. Uh, you know, what are your inside experiences uh, when it comes to strengthening national capacities for, um, uh, for evaluations? What are the, you know, the, the lessons and, you know, some of the tips or advice that you could give to, to other countries? Of course, each country is different, obviously. Uh, but, you know, based on your experience, uh, if you can share some um, of your insight, in general about national action capacity development, but then going back to the discussion that we were having before, also about strengthening and engaging and giving opportunity to, to young evaluators, because I know that your office is really a champion also in, uh, in uh, uh, engaging young, young evaluators and facilitating access to the labor market. So over to you, thanks. Thank you, uh, Marco. Thank you, Marco. <clears throat> uh, uh, in India, we have strong support for uh, monitoring and evaluation activities. It has very long history in India. In fact, when India got independence in 1947, just within few years, uh, uh, program and evaluation office has been set up in the country with primarily role of uh, evaluating the, all the social sector schemes of the, uh, the, of the plan cycles. and. Uh, and, and, and this has been, you know, uh, uh, given importance over the years in with, uh, you know, coming age when we have a, a new requirement during the 2010-2011s, uh, 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 one new office has also been created, which is a independent evaluation office, uh, with given more autonomy and more resources to undertake the big and flexible schemes of Government of India. So. Uh, Am I audible? Okay. Thank you. So, uh, 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 basically, if you see uh, uh, the monitoring and evaluation exercise in the country, 2014-15 is an important landmark year uh, because in that year, uh, three major changes have been done in the country. First, planning commissions was replaced by Niti Aayog uh, with revised rules and responsibilities. Second was, uh, there were two uh, independent monitoring systems in the country. One was uh, uh, driven by directly in the Prime Minister office, which is development monitoring units. And second was uh, uh, performance management and evaluation systems, which was uh, basically uh, driven by Cabinet Secretariat. Both, both two systems uh, was replaced by new systems, which is uh, uh, Pargati and e uh, platforms which is e-governance -govern generated systems in which uh, more robust monitoring or evaluations uh, have been started in the country. In the same year, uh, DMU was created by merging uh, Earth, Earth, Earth while uh, program evaluation office and independent evaluation office with the view that uh, should office should not take only evaluation activity in isolation with the monitoring activity. Both are basically supplementing each other. So keeping this in mind, uh, both activity has been given to single office, which is development, monitoring, and evaluation office, uh, to I belongs to, uh, with, with, with given more resources, more, uh, you know, uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and the roles and uh, kind of uh, 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 support from the government side. So the, this is the institutional uh, setup which country has experienced over many years in which uh, we try to uh, set up an national level institutions at the, national, uh, at the federal level. 
Similarly, similar setups we also aspire to uh, build or set up at the sub-national level, which is at state levels. In many uh, state governments, we could able to establish uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation office. They have very robust system, like in case of Karnataka, in case of uh, Tamil Nadu, they have very robust uh, monitoring and evaluation system at the state levels. So apart from these institutional approaches which we have done, so we have also started uh, you know parallel exercise like uh, lots of uh, uh, focus we have given towards the capacity developments of uh, uh, not only the national uh, national level official but also the uh, the official at the uh, sub national level like the states level and districts level. Different kind of model has been adopted uh, uh, in this in the in this context, and. Uh, to reinforce the uh, evaluation exercise, uh, uh, outcome-based monitoring of the of the all the central sector and centrally sponsored schemes was also initiated at the central level, with a view that every ministry should do kind of uh, evaluation at their own levels, uh, with uh, uh, overview or guidance provided by DMU Development Monitoring, monitoring Evaluation Office. The acronym of this is DMU. Uh, these are the uh, some sort of uh, 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 the uh, the individual approach which DMU has taken, and, uh, and 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 in doing all these things, we got lots of support from the development partners, uh, research institutions, and uh, universities. We also uh, 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 build up uh, you know collaboration with all these uh, all these uh, partner agencies. Right now, we have more than twenty SYE with the different entities. So uh, uh, basically, these are the kind of setups we try to build up at the national levels. And to take this forward, uh, we try to uh, uh, replicate the different model of evaluation processes at the country levels. We also uh, tested the OECD's RACI frameworks. We also tested theory of change and other frameworks which are available, uh, not for only the uh, uh, regress evaluations, but also the different kind of evaluation like rapid assessment uh, uh, like uh, a deep stick study uh, and uh, and and uh, organizational uh, uh, assessment and uh, and, uh, and uh, in the parallel we also started implementing some major monitoring frameworks exercise like uh, uh, right now we have output outcome monitoring frameworks through which we are uh, uh, monitoring all these schemes through the some you know identified output and end outcome these schemes to improve the data governance systems, we have implemented uh, data governance quality index frameworks through which we try to improve the data ecosystems across all the ministry and departments. And uh, to improve also India's position at the global level, we are also monitoring 28 global indices uh, at the country level so that uh, India's performance and the required reforms and uh, growth could also, reforms and intervention could also be strengthened on the basis of their performance there. And uh, uh, you know to uh, uh, to reinforce all this exercise, we adopted new one uh, uh, strategy at the uh, national level, uh, which is allowing young professionals and lateral intrant to work with us. We are allowing uh, we basically we have one programs uh, in which we are hiring or engaging the young professionals from the markets, and also the lateral int, uh, intrant like consultant specialist, they work with us. They uh, come for a uh, very short period of time, not short period of, for a fixed period of time. They work with us. They bring their uh, their domain expertise and work with us. So we realize that uh, only you know permanent bureaucrat is not sufficient to uh, you know uh, execute the tasks in very efficient manner. We need uh, the experienced bureaucrat along with the uh, domain expert from the market so that uh, uh, we can work in cohesion and can achieve for the betterment of the uh, you know the effectiveness and uh, basically uh, uh, efficiency of these schemes and one more exercise we have taken at the national level uh, uh, which is a uh, hiring independent evaluator at the national level to undertake the evaluation study so that uh, 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 some sort of uh, you know the independence could be imbibed in the uh, all this process but uh, as this, uh, spoken by the our next uh, earlier panelist uh, independence doesn't mean isolation. So, uh, for any evaluator, there is need to consult, have a very you know close consultative process uh, with the concerned stakeholder. Whenever we take any evaluation study, we uh, start 
you know, the consultative process at the very beginning of the study. We start, uh, you know, uh, consulting the ministry and departments on TORs, the scope of studies, uh, survey designs, sample survey, all these things we discuss with them and in the consultation with them, we, can, we finalize and take it forward. So this is the basically uh, the brief profile or, you know, functioning of uh, uh, DMU. So far as a suggestion for the, you know, the different country on uh, establishing m &E system at the country level, my suggestion would be we should uh, first set up or, uh, you know, uh, uh, develop uh, one, uh, one sort of uh, uh, evaluation pol policy or the framework under which we should establish our national entities like, uh, uh, like in case of India, we have DMU. So the similar kind of, you know, we should have a fixed entities given with some more responsibility from the government side. We should also try to ensure the, uh, the management adaptability. It means whatever evaluation finding we uh, 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 generate, uh, the buyer should be the other, on the other side. So government should accept the finding of your study. And this could be possible only when we establish the consultative process. So whenever you consult your entire process with the concerned st stakeholder, it will help you to build a trust between you and the uh, the user of the uh, your uh, evaluation studies, and that that will basically eventually help in uh, taking uh, 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 your finding taking forward by the concern uh, concern implementing agencies. And uh, the innovative approach which we have at the national level, uh, you should also try at your own level. That is a mixing culture. That is, uh, uh, you should have an, an uh, organization in which uh, experienced bureaucrat should work with. Uh, domain expert, expert from the markets. In that way only you could maximize your outputs, minimize your resources. Uh, I think uh, this is the strong message we try to propagate at the all level of uh, uh, forum. And uh, uh, we, we just, I will wrap up. You should also uh, ensure, uh, you know, uh, uh, your uh, uh, lightening with the Ministry of Finance because Ministry of Finance is the ultimate authority which are providing resources for all the things in the country. So you should also ensure we at anyhow we have tried and also got success in this endeavor. Uh, you know, every schemes right now in the India uh, get approval for their continuation or for uh, for continuation or even for the closure on the on the basis of only evaluation studies only. Even uh, we have made mandatory in all the schemes that nearly two to five percent of their uh, you know uh, resources of all the schemes should be on the molding and evaluation exercise. So these are some of few uh, few things uh, which I would like to, uh, to share with you. And remaining I have mentioned in my presentation, you can also go through that. Thank you, Marco, for giving us the time. Thank you very much. I mean, uh, uh, you know. Very, very interesting experience, and thanks for uh, reminding us about the importance, even when we talk about national region capacity in development, the importance of the sub-national level. I mean, of course, I mean, in a, in a continent like India, of course, that, that's even more, more and more important, but I would say that for any country, it's always so important to think also at the sub-national level. Um, also, really, about uh, building a relationship of trust uh, through the collaborative process and consultations, I think that's that's really uh, very important. And and you know the fact that you have been able to to hire uh, young evaluator as staff also uh, is very interesting. So, not not all organizations have the capacity to hire young people as staff, but still I think it's important to to try uh, to engage young people. For example, also as a consultant in evolution teams, and this brings me to to the to the last panelist, uh, uh, Oyuna from uh, the UNFPA Regional uh, Evaluation Office uh, for Asia and Pacific. If you can share with us really your experience in uh, engaging and supporting uh, young evaluators in the actual conduction of of, uh, of evaluation. So, what has been the experience, and if you have any 
advice and tips for uh, uh, everybody else. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Marco. Good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, yeah, we've heard a lot from uh, the previous panelists, especially from the UN agencies, um, how UNIDAP has been supporting uh, young and emerging evaluators who are focusing more on capacity development, also opportunities for networking, advocacy efforts, and etc. And um, as Marco said, um, uh, we had some experience uh, that we would like to draw using this platform and and also uh, promote uh the actual inclusion of young and emerging evaluators in the evaluation teams um, based on the experience we had in the last two years in UNFPA country program evaluations. So we had six uh, country program evaluations that engaged young and emerging evaluators as a team member. Uh, and I just wanted to say at the beginning that um, none of them had worked in complex evaluations before as evaluators, and some of them didn't have any evaluation experience, they had research experience. So um, that was um, something we started with and uh, from the TOR stage, of course, uh, because we were not very sure about the pool of young and emerging evaluators in a particular country, so we had to keep the TORs quite flexible enough so that we have a good pool uh, to apply, but also uh, try to add the technical uh, tasks because we also want them to meaningfully contribute to the evaluation. So we had to find that balance in the TOR and I think we found a good balance and um, we were able to recruit six uh, uh, young and emerging evaluators uh, in, uh, as a part of evaluation teams. Um, and they had very different roles to play, but they were engaged from the very beginning until the end of the evaluation. So they did document reviews uh, and initial analysis, of course, at the inception phase. They facilitated some interviews. They facilitated focus group discussions. They did some analysis um, of findings. And um, they also were reviewing what other team members were writing in terms of findings and um, conclusions and recommendations. So they were also providing that feedback to, to overall content of the evaluation products. Um, and also they gave access to key informants that otherwise uh, the, uh, you know, the evaluation managers or the evaluation teams wouldn't have had. And I'll come back to that because it was also a very important contribution from uh, the YEs we had engaged as well. Um, and at the end, uh, we had a better quality evaluation because the evaluation teams had young and emerging evaluators. Because they brought in the, of course, voices of young people. They brought in very new perspectives. And it's, in some cases, it was quite uh, good learning also from, for everybody involved, including seasoned evaluation team members as well as uh, UNFP country office colleagues, because they were learning from young people um, on some of those perspectives. And in some cases, we made a deliberate effort uh, to hire young and emerging evaluators from underrepresented groups. We had uh, a young and emerging evaluator who had some visual uh, uh, impairment, for example, or who had represented gender minority groups. So it was very good to have their perspectives brought in, and I really believe that quality of evaluations was so much better because they, they brought the disability inclusion, the gender uh, uh, equality uh, perspectives very strongly in the evaluation as well. Um, and um, also we uh, um, found during uh, this um, process that uh, understanding the roles of young and emerging evaluators and supporting them uh, is so important for every key st stakeholder involved. It's not only the evaluation manager or the UNFP country office in that case who were engaged with young and emerging evaluators, but also key informants, uh, because uh, we understood that uh, during this process, we understood none of them were in, uh, engaged in evaluations that had YEs in their teams, evaluation teams. So it was quite a unique experience for them. And so it took some effort uh, from the evaluation team and evaluation managers to convey their role, their importance, you know, and uh, that the need to engage with them so that all the key stakeholders, including key informants, understood and supported um, young and emer emerging evaluators in, in, the, in that process as well. And of course, in the planning stage, it was so important to allocate financial resources. And in this case, we had both country office uh, resources as well as the regional office supplementing uh, uh, the funding so that we could hire uh, those um, young and emerging evaluators as well. And in terms of the experience of young and emerging evaluators, um, uh, it, it was 
win and win situation for everybody involved. It was such a rich learning experience for the young evaluators. Um, and they learned a lot. They were motivated. And uh, they had a really great relationships with the evaluation team uh, leaders and members because then it was like daily coaching uh, on the technical aspects and also on other aspects of uh, on soft skills as well, which um, I'll explain a bit later. Um, and it also uh, brought other opportunities for young and emerging evaluators. Like a couple of them later on were employed by the UN because they they, they already knew how capable that person was. And um, and some of them were invited as guest speakers uh, to speak at the academia or to different conferences. And uh, one of uh, and some of them were interested to pursue, pursue career in monitoring, especially in evaluation, because of this experience. And we had a one uh, YE who um, decided to pursue masters, focusing on program management with a component on evaluation, because they, they thought it's, it was a good career and a very interesting career path as well. Um, and we also had one of them invited to the government project advisory committee uh, because it also helped them to establish that network when they were part of the evaluation team. Um, and um, also it, uh, we uh, came to know that it's not only technical skills are important for young and emerging evaluators, not only understanding um, evaluation methodologies, approaches, uh, uh, also uh, in the writing skills, but also soft skills like how to facilitate focus group discussions, how to facilitate interviews, for example, how to communicate the ideas. And, and of course, if, as we all know, evaluation is a very intensive exercise and how to prioritize their daily tasks. So all of these soft uh, skills were also so important. And those who already had some more advanced you know, level of skills, they were quite, um, they were getting a lot out of this experience. So that's uh, something to keep in mind for the future training programs for uh, young and emerging evaluators to also include those soft skills as well, because it also makes a, a lot of di difference in terms of the knowledge gain, in terms of the contributions to the evaluation as well. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, not all of them were engaged in the evaluation before, so uh, they were not always familiar with evaluation norms and standards, and that's something we had to really um, uh, explain and uh, it was the on-the-job training basically from the inception stage and um, and that was really good uh, because we had them uh, supervised by very experienced evaluation team le leaders and we had uh, on average three to oh, sorry four to five evaluation team members as well so they also had experience and they were so willing uh, and committed to coach them in every aspect of the evaluation so so that was a really great uh, uh, thing to see. And in terms of lessons learned, uh, and we also have heard from other um, speakers as well, uh, the meaningful engagement of young and emerging evaluators in evaluations need to be seen as a key element of a larger evaluation system and to be supported as such. Um, uh, and, and that includes all the different elements that we've heard uh, today, including uh, evaluation policies, national or organizational evaluation policies, capacity development opportunities, career opportunities, and all of those elements need to come together to really support the young and emerging evaluators to, uh, to gain more experience. Uh, and then uh, there is also uh, supporting uh, young and emerging evaluators uh, to be in evaluation teams and giving them technical skills, uh, technical tasks, because um, uh, most of them were given technical tasks. They, they, uh, they were responsible for a specific part of the program, and that was a really great experience, and they handled it really, really well. So I think we should not shy away to, to really give them technical areas of work as we would give to other members of the evaluation team, including the national evaluation team members. Uh, and uh, and I also explained earlier that promoting roles of young and emerging evaluators to key stakeholders needs to be continuously done because uh, I think, uh, as, as mentioned, uh, uh, not many people had that experience of working of young and emerging evaluators. So it's really important that we keep educating and promoting the roles of young and emerging evaluators uh, in evaluations as well. 
Um, and one lesson learned also, it's more towards the young and emerging evaluators themselves. Uh, we thought that uh, when we uh, first announced this, these opportunities, that there would be a good pool of young uh, and emerging evaluators who would be willing to apply, and we struggled. Because when we tried to reach them through WAPES or you know, to, through professional networks, not many people were interested. So we had to go to two, three rounds and sometimes really have a targeted approach. So, um, so it's important for young people to expand their networks. And uh, my last takeaway would be trust the young and emerging evaluators. They can do a wonderful job if they are part of the evaluation teams. So it's a win-win situation for everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Yuna. Uh, again, another very fascinating experience. And thanks to re remind us that we have to be intentional if we want to engage with young, young uh, people. Thanks for reminding us that, you know, when we talk about young people, we are not talking about a uh, kind of homogeneous populational group, but so all the aspect of intersectionality that you mentioned, I think it's uh, uh, also a very good reminder. And the fact that it's a two-way learning is not only young people that is that are learning from the seniors, but also the seniors are learning from from the young people. So, as you said, it's a win-win uh, situation. So we have uh, 15 minutes for a question and answer. So uh, now it's your turn to to ask a question or even perhaps share uh, your experience. Uh, and you know we can just take a, a perhaps a, a group of, a, of questions and when you take the floor if you can please uh, uh, very, very briefly introduce uh, yourself who you are in what organization you work and from which country you are from so i see the first one here and then over there um, thank you very much i'm victoria from armenia representing the office of the prime minister uh, thank you for a very interesting panel discussion. Actually, um, Armenia has been uh, going through public administration reforms, and I used to be an evaluator, and now I'm, I'm a policy advisor coordinating these reforms, and part of which is the establishment of an m and framework in the country. As you rightly mentioned, it's not only about the demand and the supply of evaluation, but rather it's about establishing an institutional arrangements that help this evaluation system to fully function and to have systemic evaluations across the whole government. Uh, in Armenia throughout these years, also due to the help of development partners, we have managed to establish some m and frameworks for large programs, specifically in social sector, active labor market programs, social benefits, etc. And also we had conducted some evaluations which unfortunately were not, uh, well, they didn't have any consequences or rather had negative consequences for the ministries because the funding was cut down by the Ministry of Finance. <laughs> uh, given all these challenges, we have the political will to establish a system that supports systemic evaluations uh, within a whole of the government approach. As a part of that, we understand that it requires time and also, uh, well, large financial resources. And we are unable to do everything, like creating an m and framework, developing capacities through trainings and other activities, establishing an institutional framework, etc. So given your experience in both national and international levels, uh, with, what would be your advice? Where should we start from and which uh, consecutive steps should be undertaken to, su to succeed in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think there was yeah. somebody there and then uh, in, in this table. Okay, uh, I'm Sanat Manage representing Save the Children Sri Lanka. So my question, part of the question is also mostly linked with that one. Because as Sri Lanka, so we had uh, some experience because in uh, we already had a national policy approved by the parliament for the evaluation, I think six years ago. So recently we were able to launch that policy. Then we don't know when we see really is going to implement in the country because uh, moving forward is very slow back with the, with the politician and the, with the constant support. So I like to hear that India is already go forward with that. So Indian colleague already highlighted that Indian, all of the ministries already having a evaluation component and then they are starting doing so i like to know from the indian colleague as well so then how it's going to maintain the independence in your evaluation 
done by the each ministry so then what is the quality of that evaluation so how many evaluations so so already completed within that framework thank you thank you i think we have time only for one more probably oh so there are many more now <laughs> yes thank you and uh, thank you for the presentation and congratulations for the different for bringing together these different perspectives um my question goes to uh, maybe our colleagues Akilesh, Romulo, and Radhika. How can development partners better support national evaluation capacity development? Thanks for a very quick question. So this gives time for the last question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, so mine's also super quick. And uh, uh, first, I'm Arushi. I work. I self-identify as a young and hopefully emerging evaluator. Um, and I work with UN Women as an evaluation analyst. Um, I really like the point that Randika raised on the lack of professional degrees in the global south, at least on um, evaluation, especially access to young women who might not have access to such a niche or experimental field, ex at least in the global south. So when it comes down to it, we have this gap in our applications on um, and we have to prove, we have to compensate for this uh, lack of professional degrees by highlighting our value add. And uh, Oyuna mentioned um, uh, these new perspectives that, that young e and emerging evaluators bring. So um, in your experience um, as panel members, both within the UN system and with the government, what do you think is, uh, what do you think young and emerging evaluators bring to the table? What is their value add? Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I saw other hands, but unfortunately, I think we, we don't have time. So just feel free after the session to reach out the different panelists with your question. Uh, as we have only about six to seven minutes, I would say only two minutes each. Uh, and so just pick up the questions or that, that you would like to address and, and uh, who would like to go first? <laughs> Go for, I'll take the okay, first there one. is a volunteer oh, there. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. No, no. Okay, perfect. Uh, so I will take the, the first question, the question from, I think, believe, Victoria, no? Correct, regarding, so I'm not aware exactly of the case of Armenia, but I believe based on, on what you said, uh, I think one of the more common sense entry point will be to do uh, what was presented earlier this morning, so the MESA, so having a diagnostic of exactly what are the capacity uh, on, on evaluation, what is exactly the ecosystem, what are the different entry points that could be done to develop further the, the evaluation uh, uh, capacity in Armenia. I think there's two points there that are important. Not only the end results of, of this product, which will be bringing a common understanding and then being able to develop a, a, a plan to uh, increase those capacity, but I think the process has a lot of value because you bring together a lot of different actors to discuss about the, the what is needed and you create a momentum. And I think both, both actually are very important uh, uh, to keep in mind. Thank you. Yeah, a uh, quick answer to uh, question of Ricardo. Uh, I think the um, donor agencies, uh, especially UN agencies, can uh, provide support uh, by uh, with the wealth of knowledge resources that you have, and uh, also with the convening power of uh, uh, the, the UN agencies. I think when they invite uh, government agencies to a meeting, they come. So I think that we have uh, to, again, as I mentioned, um, evaluation champions should collaborate, and I think uh, UN agencies can help facilitate the collaboration of UN, uh, UN champions. Uh, for the Armenia, uh, uh, my suggestion, uh, uh, I'm, I have not uh, so much experience in the field of uh, evaluation. I, have not, I don't have. But so far, I, I learned to, uh, from the Indian uh, scenario. Uh, I suggest my suggestion would be you should, you should, you, your country should start with outcome based monitoring of all these schemes or interventions of the government your governments so that you know this will make the whole of government approach not uh, not make a one single agency responsible to execute the tasks of uh, evaluation otherwise uh, they, they they become the, 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 the single entity will become you know uh, very sensitive to defend the finding of the evaluation study so make it the whole government approach 
so that everybody are, uh, should involve in the process of you know outcome based monitoring of their interventions second would we should start partnering with the development agencies because in we, what we learn that uh, you know uh, uh, in hindi there is kahabat merdhak ka chuha kuhe ka merdhak so basically the sense of this uh, 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 sentence is that uh, until or unless you open your mind with uh, development partner because development partner has lots of experience and learning because of their presence across whole world they have different offices in different part of the country so the kind of expertise kind of knowledge kind of peer learning they have so is enormous you should get uh, you know so you, you should interact with them uh, learn them and accordingly you implement the same in your localized version in your uh, in your country and uh, and 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 for the uh, uh, for the sri lankan uh, uh, questions uh, you know it is very very difficult to also uh, you know uh, sometimes when you maintain independence in your study by uh, you know hiring third party independent evaluator to undertake the study you know you know sometimes you may get pressure from the implementing agency that no i am not agree with your finding because your sample size your evaluation processes are not robust kind of things so only the way to tackle this kind of issue is to make your process very scientific and robust then only you can defend uh, your evaluation finding Uh, otherwise they will bombard you with uh, you know the kind of uh, because they are they are the implementing agency and on the basis of your finding they may they have to may, they may have to close your, uh, their schemes so sometimes they become very offensive whenever you fi- share your finding with them and so far as number of study conducted in india after uh, development of uh, after establishment of dmu development monitoring evaluation office we nearly conducted nearly 200 evaluation study in the country so far in the last 3 4 years Uh, in 1921 we have undertaken uh, you know flex uh, uh, rigorous evaluation of nearly 126 central sector schemes big schemes so on the basis of their finding many schemes were closed down many schemes were rationalized and even uh, some new schemes were you know uh, uh, proposed then some schemes may get more resources on the basis of the finding so uh, uh, this is our experience in case of uh, india so far as how we can uh, you know engage development partner there is no question about it you know develop i what we found is that you know uh, what the, the issue with the permanent bureaucrat in in the country is that they are they are on the transferable job sometimes they are working in one department sometimes they may get transferred to and start working in the different departments so they unable to bring you know the holistic, uh, holistic approach in executing one uh, one sort of uh, you know activity like monitoring or evaluation because of lack of lack of experience in uh, you know in that sector in that context development partner having their vast vast knowledge you know uh, uh, in that sectors so you can leverage them you can use them uh, uh, in case of india we are taking support in three three area one for the technical support we are getting their support uh, uh, their assistance second is, is in the resource mobilization and third third, uh, third one is on capacity development which is very important in case of india different kind of uh, you know capacity development program has been initiated in india like we have developed a mini competency framework uh, we have also integrated our uh, training program with uh, 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 integrated uh, government platform training platforms uh, we have also designed a uh, number of uh, different uh, modules of training programs to uh, you know uh, the suit uh, to address the requirement of different stakeholder like workshop consultation short term training long term training kind of things So these are some of my experience which I have shared with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so for the question of um, one you raised, uh, so I think one thing UNIDAP members can do is there are nationally valued chapters. If they can help support some of their activities, like for example, I said UNICEF uh, has a partnership with Evaluate Pakistan, where in every consulting project there, an Evaluate member has to be part of that consulting team. So Evaluate members uh, they recommend someone, and also in Sri Lanka, Evalu- um, UNICEF supported several capacity building programs. So I think the Evaluate chapters nationally need support, and if UNIDAP members can. support the activities that's good because normally these chapters also have high turnover in order to keep their members we need to have activities going 
and that's uh, that funding support is critical in order to sustain them thank you Maybe I can briefly respond to Arush's question. Yeah, in terms of the new perspectives, of course, in um, addition to the specific tasks assigned to them, uh, the team members, evaluation team members, really appreciated when they um, asked the questions to really um, uh, question the assumptions, because we all make certain assumptions when we interpret uh, findings, evidence, and that was really one critical component they really appreciated. Um, and also the making sense of the findings, because uh, for UNFPA we also have youth programs within our country programs, so they really help to interpret the findings in a meaningful way. Um, and, and in addition to that, the networks really help to reach out to those that couldn't probably have reached uh, if the young people, young and emerging evaluators were not in the teams. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I've I'm afraid I don't have time to to make uh, all the summary of the very rich discussion. Uh, I think we are already a little bit over time. Uh, ju just to remind, so I hope that you really got some uh, uh, in insights on on national capacity development and, and the engagement of, of young people. Uh, just as a reminder, I think we are uh, uh, all together in this. And you know, this campaign evolution for action that is led by the global eval use uh, network, the global parliamentarian forum for evaluation and, and UNFPA uh, is really trying to uh, push forward the, the engagement of young people. So there are already 200 members, I mean 200 organizations between uh, governments, parliaments, civil society, academia, etc. that are member and uh, a manifesto for the meaningful engagement of young people was launched last year more than 1,000 between organization and, and, and uh, individuals as signed. Uh, and thanks a lot also uh, the, the government of India for being among them. Uh, and there are also st standards for uh, the actual Im implementation of the, of the manifesto. So just Google uh, Eval for Action uh, and try to, to have a look at this manifesto for the meaningful engagement of young people. And, and you know, if you agree with that, just sign it and then try to uh, implement uh, the, the principles that are in this manifesto. So with this, please join me in a round of applause for the great uh, presenter and panelists. And thank you very much for being with us today and have a great evening. Thanks. Thank you.